All right. I know we're moving swiftly, but again, we want to kind of um, begin to review and think about those different topics as we look at some of these questions. One of the other really key components of the exam is going to be the short answer question. And so let's dive a little bit deeper into the structure of the short answer question for both those of you who are taking it on paper and those of you who are taking it digitally. If we look at the paper version, it's going to be the same format as it's been in the past, where you've got the, the three types of questions, the two passages where you're comparing the, the secondary sources and they're on a topic and they disagree in some way. You've got a primary source, maybe an image or a political cartoon, and one that's non-stimulus based. Those of you taking the digital exam, the first section of your short answer is going to have a different set of, of question types. You're going to have one that's a primary source. You're going to have one set of, of short answer questions based on a map. And you're going to have one that is a primary source image of some sort. And then your second set, because remember what we looked at at the very beginning, that short answer question, you're going to have the, um, you're going to have the, the LEQ, if you're taking the digital version, replaced by an additional set of SAQs. And that second set of SAQs will look like this. You're going to have a data set of some sort. And, and we'll talk more about how you handle a data set in a different session. And then a secondary source text. And so this is going to be the, the setup. You will have this where those of you taking it on uh, paper will only have the original three. You'll have an LEQ essay, long essay question to read, to write uh, in your second free response part. So let's look at some strategies for how you want to approach this. So in the short answer question, each question has three parts, an A, a B, and a C. And that's how it's scored. It's all or nothing. You either get full credit for your answer for A, or you get no credit for it. So there are a total of nine points possible on the SAQ section one point for each of the three parts of the three questions. So you want to be strategic, maximize your points and get credit where you know you can get it. Um, answer exactly what's being asked. That's one of the things that my students sometimes struggle with is that they begin to, to kind of stray off of what's being asked. If it's asking about um, a difference between two things, they might want to talk about a similarity sometimes. But we've kind of sorted that out and they're doing a little bit better with it now. But you want to make sure that you stay focused on exactly what's being asked and you need to be specific in your answer. Give an example. Show off all the, the knowledge that you have, all of that vocabulary. Plug that into the SAQ. This is really where you can make yourself stand out with all of that knowledge that you have. For example, what if we were to, to have a question and it was asking about US foreign policy traditions, you know, a continuity over time. So what if you said the United States has a long tradition of neutrality? That's true. But what makes a better answer? What if we said Washington warned against alliances in his farewell address and that position of neutrality was followed by future presidents up through um, World War II? Which is the more sophisticated, complete answer? Of course, the one that has specific vocabulary. So you want to plug that in as well. So I want us to look at some examples that tie together all of this information that we've been looking at in this session. So I have pulled three different SAQs that relate to time periods one and two. And these came from AP Classroom. We're going to be looking at, again, our question types comparison which is similarities and differences, and then the continuity and change over time, what changes with native and European contact and what remains the same. And you'll see what I'm talking about when we look at those questions. So I want us to transition. Um, and I've, I've put together a few sample answers. And I want us to evaluate whether or not you can pick out those complete answers. So here we've got, this is um, the first question. And so again, this is, is tying in to what we've already looked at with the comparison between the Spanish and the English colonies. And so I'm, I've got a sample answer that I'm gonna show you, but I want us to, to look at the question itself first. Briefly explain one important similarity. So this would be a comparison kind of question between the goals of the Spanish and the English in establishing colonies in the Americas prior to 1700. So when they give you a time period here, your examples, your evidence that you use has to be within that time period. You can't stray outside 
side of it. So anything that you come up with English colonization later on in the 1750s would not be eligible there. And then we want to have a difference. So this is a comparison style question, but it's in the form of an SAQ. And then we want to look at so this is a difference between the Spanish and the English in the Americas prior to 1700. And then one way in which the difference you indicated, so whatever the difference is that you've indicated up here, how does that contribute to a difference in the development of the Spanish and English colonies? So if we're looking at how something developed, so wouldn't this be, how does this difference cause a change in, in how the colonies were set up? So I want us to look at a sample answer and I made this answer up. And I want you to think about three sentences setting up your answer for each of your short answer question prompts. So if we look at the first sentence, I want you to think about the first sentence is answering the question, give an answer. And then your second sentence would be your examples of the Spanish and the English similarities or the Spanish and the English differences. And then your third sentence is tying that together and giving an explanation. So let's see if we can identify how I've done that here. So one important similarity, and notice that I've labeled it. So I've got my um, SAQs. I want to make it easy on the reader. I want to label it if I'm answering A, B, or C. And you can answer that in a different order. So if you um, were more confident with one, you could put B first and then C first. So if I look at this, one important similarity between the goals of the Spanish and the English in establishing colonies prior to the 1700 is that both nations sought to acquire wealth. So that's going to be my claim of how they're similar. Now I've got to prove it. So I always tell my students, think that, think about yourself being maybe a, um, a lawyer and you're trying to prove to a jury that your claim that both of these nations were trying to acquire wealth, prove it to me. All right. So I've got to have some evidence. So here's going to be my evidence for the Spanish. Now, I can't just give evidence for one and not the other. I've got to have examples for both. The Spanish ex extracted large amounts of gold and silver. So here's my evidence that they're trying to find wealth from their colonies in Mexico using the labor of natives. Some of the English colonies were also planted in North America to provide wealth. Now, notice I say some because some of them, like in, in New England, we already said were related to religion, but some of them were planted for wealth. An example would be the wealth gained from tobacco production in the Virginia colony. So Spain and England both sought wealth through either mineral extraction or desirable um, soil and climate in the North uh, America, right? So they're, they're trying to find their wealth either through minerals coming out of the ground or because of what they can grow there. So I've got my answer. I have my examples and then I've tied it together to prove that my claim is accurate. All right, so let's do that for B. Now we've done the similarities, we wanna look at some differences. So here, let's see if we found our answer. The Spanish and English differed in their approach to religion. So that's my answer. I'm saying they're different related to religion. Now I wanna give an example and proof of that. The Spanish were more intent on spreading Catholicism to the native population through the mission system. So they're going to try to use the mission system to convert natives, which served as a means to involve the local community into Spanish culture. The English Puritans instead, right? So I'm saying that the Puritans planted Massachusetts Bay to escape what they viewed as inappropriate Catholic traditions in the Church of England. So this is how they're different. They both are approaching religion differently. This is about trying to convert natives to Catholicism, and this is about trying to escape it. So let me try, try, to, try to tie that together. Spanish and English colonies therefore differed in their fundamental views of the Catholic tradition. So that's going to prove my answer about a difference related to religion. So then we get into this third question. Let me remind you what it is. Explain one way in which the difference you indicated contributed to a difference in the development of Spanish and English colonial societies. So how does this lead to a difference in their societies? So the difference in religion, I've got to stick with the same one that I had above uh, and how the Spanish and the English colonists interacted with indigenous people. So this is going to lead to a difference and how they interact with the natives because the Spanish wanted to convert to Catholicism. They worked to integrate the natives 
into Spanish culture unequally though, right? So they don't get equality, but they're, they're bringing them in through that and coming into the mission system. And this was not a priority for the English. So I was, I was running out of space here, but I've tied it together. Acculturation of the natives was not part of the early English colonial society. All right, so I've answered those questions and we've got those comparisons. So now if we look at my second example, we want to look at how contact between the natives and the Europeans brought change to Native American society in the period 1492 to 1700. So what kind of a question is this? Is it comparison, causation, or continuity and change over time? We are looking at changes here. So this would be how did the natives and Europeans, how did their in, in interaction bring change to the native society. So this is something important. You want to make sure you could get confused here and talk about changes within Europe, but that's not the, what the question is asking. The question is asking, how did Native American society change? Um, and then we've got um, briefly explain a second example of how contact between Native American and Europeans brought changes to the Native American society. So this is, again, you're basically going to be coming up with two different changes. And then give an example of how Native American societies resisted that change. All right, so think back to what we discussed at the beginning of the session. So if we start here, one example, I want to answer it first. What's my example of how contact with Europeans changed American society? I'm going to say that it's in the loss of population through disease. That's going to be one of the things that led to um, a change, loss of population through disease. Now I need an example of that. When did that really happen? Prove that it truly happened. And so here's my example. Smallpox was brought to North America by the European explorers and wiped out an enormous part of the native population they lacked um, because they lacked immunity. So now I want to tie it together. This loss in population changed native society because here's why. This is why it changes that society because they reduced populations prevented them from successfully resisting European takeover of land. So I'm saying I've got to show how it changes their society, not just that they that a, a lot of the native population died. I've got to show how does it change their society? Well, they end up losing their land because they can't defend it anymore because they've lost their numbers. A second example um, of how contract, contact with Europeans changed Native American societies I'm going to say is the introduction of the horse um, through the Columbian exchange, right? Show off that knowledge that you've got those words, Columbian exchange. So as Native American society, I've got to give an example. When was the horse used and where was it used? So I'm going to say here, um, as Native American societies adapted horses for use in hunting and warfare, they became more mobile and successful in hunting bison. So that's going to help them out and tribes of the Great Plains became particularly adept at using horses to challenge their enemies in warfare and enhance their ability to hunt over long distances. So this again shows how it changes their society. Here's an example of who does it. And this is how it changes their society because they can now challenge their enemies better in warfare and they can hunt under, over longer distances. Then an example of the Native American resistance. So how did, how did the natives fight back to this? So my answer here, I'm going to say, is the Pueblo Revolt. So they're going to fight back through violence and warfare. There's my answer. My example of where that happened is here with the Pueblo Revolt or Pope's Rebellion. You can uh, use either of those terms. So I can't just drop in a name. That's one thing that I tell my students. You can't just name drop. You can't just throw out Pope's Revolt. There's my answer and not explain what it is. You have to show the reader of your exam, you know what you're talking about. So once you've got Pueblo Revolt here, you've got to define it. So we've got the Pueblo Revolt or Pope's Rebellion was staged in New Mexico by natives against their Spanish colonizers. The Pueblo people had been uh, faced with Spanish efforts to take their land and missionary efforts at Catholic conversion. The revolt organized by the leader Pope was coordinated and was temporary, temporarily successful. So this is my definition of my example. I've defined what it was um, and it was temporarily successful in resisting Spanish influence. And so there I've set up my answer. I've answered the question that they resisted through violence and warfare. I've given my example and I've tied it back together. All right, our final example for this session 
is going to be looking at another part of time period two that we've not yet mentioned tonight, but I'm squeezing it in here with this last question. So we're looking at the ideas of the Great Awakening and the Enlightenment. So you'll remember that the first Great Awakening, this is that idea of um, religious um, influence trying to promote religion across the, the, the colonies and trying to kind of bring back that, that religious foundation. The Enlightenment is where you've got this European influence where science and reason was taking hold. So if we look at here, um, again, we've got similarities and differences. So this is another example of a comparison style question. So we have briefly described one specific historical difference in North America, right? So we're not talking about in Europe, we're talking about in North America between the first great awakening and the enlightenment. And then we wanna have a similarity um, in North America between the great awakening and the enlightenment. And then we wanna look at how, um, what is one specific effect? So we're actually getting in causation and comparison in the same set of SAQs. So we're looking at what effect in North America um, did either the Great Awakening or the Enlightenment have on uh, North America. So let's look at my answer and we're gonna follow this the same way. So regardless of whether it's a comparison, a causation or a continuity and change over time, you wanna do the same thing. Answer the question, give your specific example, show off that vocabulary you know, and then tie it together at the end. All right, so a historical difference between the first great awakening and the enlightenment and then in North America is the focus on individuals and how they understand the world. So how do they understand the world? This is a difference, right? So it's a philosophy on who you're looking to for explanation about why society is the way that it is. Now I've got to show that I've got to prove it that they differed in these ideas. Supporters of the enlightenment, such as Ben Franklin, notice how I throw in a specific example there, stress the use of reason and science to explain the physical world through experimentation and research. And notice that my example is from North America, because that's what the question asked for me to do. Then I've got to show that the um, members of the Great Awakening are going to, to look at the world in a different view. So supporters of the Great Awakening, such as the famous traveling minister, Jonathan Edwards, you may remember him. I know in my class, we read Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Um, that was one of his, his sermons. Um, stressed emotion and religion to explain the physical world and the role of individuals. So here's my evidence. And now I want to tie it together. The different, um, here we are, the different perspectives drove efforts such as religious revivals to counteract the increasingly popular publications of enlightened thinkers. And so this is going to show the difference. Then my next one is about a similarity. So the similarity between the first great awakening and the enlightenment is that they both are going to challenge traditional authority, right? So we've got to prove that the great awakening ministers challenge the traditional church of England. So this is going to challenge the church of England where they were the only uh, religion that was allowed in many places. That's going to kind of change that. We're going to see some new denominations um, over society by resulting denominations that formed during the period, such as Methodism. Notice that I give an example. I can't just say that they challenge it. I've got to prove it. Enlightenment ideas related to political systems challenge traditional monarchies um, as evidenced by John Locke's social contract theory in which people hold the power of the government system instead of the monarch being unrestricted. Um, so I've tied that together. And then the effect that this is going to have uh, of the Enlightenment, and, and I chose the Enlightenment. So the effect of the Enlightenment on North America can be seen in the growth of the Patriot cause. So there's my answer. I'm going to say that Enlightenment, um, you know, kind of challenging traditional thought here. I'm going to say that it, it fosters the Patriots. Well, I've got to prove it. So now I'm going to say this led to colonists to break from the English monarchy. Thomas Jefferson uses John Locke's Enlightenment ideas of natural rights as the foundation for a call for independence for them to govern themselves. And so this is going to be a challenge to traditional authority. So I have proven that that's the case. All right, so there's our three examples real quick uh, of the um, 
short answer questions related to time periods one and two. So let's come back and let's look at what we've done in this first session here of our AP exam review. We've looked at the formats between the digital and the paper version. We've looked at some of those content, content essentials and boy, we've zipped through it, but you can look at those AP daily videos for more detailed um, um, content, more, more expanded coverage of the content. And we focused on multiple choice and short answer questions. Now, in the next session, Mr. Pulaski is going to be reviewing time period three, and he's going to focus more on the multiple choice questions and looking at some of the other formats. Later in the session, I'll be back with you on Wednesday, and we're going to be talking more closely about the document-based question and the long essay question. So, as I mentioned at the beginning, I am so glad that you're here and that you're working with us to review for your AP exam and you're smart to be starting early. But if you have any comments or any questions, anything that you think you would like to, to see addressed now, keep in mind, we've not covered the entire exam yet. That will be coming in future episodes, but use this QR code and make sure that you submit that Google, Google form and give us some feedback on, on what you think about our work here with AP Live on YouTube. So I'm Dr. Rhonda Webb, and I teach at Lassiter High School in Marietta, Georgia, and I was so glad that you were here with me tonight. So keep reading and go make history.